Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We're in open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And today we have the great honor of being with Mr. Lenny Lutze, who is the official town historian of Hoboken, New Jersey. And I've had the great pleasure of knowing uh, Lenny for many years since Claudia and I live in Hoboken. And um, He's got so much knowledge, it's almost encyclopedic of, of the town itself, of the history of Hoboken. And in particular, we're going to go deeper into two elements of Hoboken that are very famous, which is Frank Sinatra and the movie On the Waterfront. So we're going to go deep into those two things, but also covering whatever might co come up spontaneously in this dialogue, this, this back and forth discussion with Lenny Litzy. We're in his beautiful home in Hoboken. It's just gorgeous here. And uh, he's got so much to say. He's worked in show business a lot. He's been around show business in New York, working with actors. So he's just so entertaining. He's an interesting person to talk to. I could spend hours and hours talking to Lenny. And you're going to get to know him here. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's pass the microphone to Lenny Lutze and welcome uh, to the Public Voice Salon. Let's just talk in general to begin with about Hoboken. Hoboken has changed so much over the years. I first moved to Hoboken, it was in 1988, and we've seen a lot of gentrification, a lot of newcomers coming in. You were born and raised in Hoboken, so you sort of span that gap from the history of town to what's going on now. I was watching On the Waterfront on Turner Classic Movies the other day, and I just never get tired of that movie. It's just a magical film. And after the next day, I'm walking down Washington Street and I'm thinking to myself, you know, some of these guys who are in this movie who were extras and stuff, they're still walking around, you know, and yet there are people in Hoboken who are maybe new in town. They don't even know this stuff. They don't even know this. There's so much rich history and you bring that out, Lenny. So let's just welcome you to the show. And uh, so what, what, what is the historical significance of Hoboken, New Jersey? People could be watching us all over the world. We're on the internet. They could be watching us in Australia. They could be watching us on the moon. What is it about Hoboken, New Jersey that makes it such an historical town? First of all, thank you for that very kind introduction. And to answer the question that you just asked me, I don't think we have enough of time. <laughs> However, you're, you're right. I mean, there is something very magical about Hoboken. Uh, as you said, I do come from an old Hoboken family. My father's people, my great-grandfather, Leonardo Lutze, uh, when his came to Hoboken in 1883. Uh, my mother's grandparents came in 1891. My grandfather was baptized in St. Francis Church in 1892, same church where Sinatra was baptized and where five generations of my family was baptized. So I think we're kind of like an old Hoboken family. But Hoboken certainly has a, a tremendous magic. Uh, it's only a mild square. And it's totally amazing. Uh, my wife and I have been fortunate enough to do a lot of traveling. And it seems that everywhere we go, we meet somebody who lived in Hoboken or from Hoboken originally. Uh, just an example. Last year, we did a Baltic cruise. And we're in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I like to wear a lot of Hoboken shirts and the Hoboken jacket. And we at Catherine the Great Summer Palace. And these three girls from California go, and we're going to take a picture, and they have three cameras. They go, get together. I'll take the three cameras, but you have to take me and my wife. <laughs> this girl looks at my jacket, and she goes, are you from Hoboken? And I go, yes. She goes, there's a girl who's not here today. She's back on the ship who was born and raised in Hoboken. So I meet her the next day, and I find out, oh, where did you live? She says, oh, I grew up on 10th and Bloomfield. I live on 9th in Bloomfield. I actually went to high school with her cousin. Uh, it's, just, it's just totally amazing. I mean, we've met people in Russia. We've met people in Italy. We've met people in England and the Caribbean. Everywhere we go, it's amazing. Somebody has a niece, a nephew, a cousin who lived in Hoboken. 
Wow, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, Hoboken people, born and raised people, I just love them. They're salt of the earth people. They're, they're kind, generous people. They're great storytellers. There's a kind of charisma I find about natural born Hobokenites, the Italians especially. You know, there's a, there's a chutzpah with Sinatra. We see that. I, I often say that Sinatra could not have been born in the suburbs. No way. He, he's from the streets of Hoboken, and it's in his swagger, it's in his personality. Why don't we start with Sinatra then? Why don't we go into that? That. And what is your uh, recollections of Sinatra, of the, any particular stories that you want to tell? Everybody does it their own way. Claudia and I, every year on Sinatra's birthday, we like to film a special just to commemorate that. This last one was his 100th anniversary. It would have been 100 years old. So let's just talk. Lenny Lutzi on Sinatra. You go for it. Well, John, as most people my age have a Sinatra story, who were born and raised here, and I'm no exception. Uh, in 1979, I was the transportation coordinator on a little film called Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. And I became good friends with Berth Lancaster. And we're down at resorts, and up on the marquee it says that Thanksgiving weekend, Frank Sinatra is going to be appearing at Atlantic City. So I immediately go into my Hoboken shtick, and I tell Bert, Frank Santirene lives on the next block from me. His Uncle Cham taught my dad how to box when he was a kid in a recreation center on Jefferson Street, you know, all this story. So uh, Bert was really a, a great guy. Uh, and so we're talking, and I said, ah, you know, Bert, you think maybe production has a way to get some good seats? <laughs> so Bert turns around and he says, well, his Aunt Irene lives on the next block from you. Maybe she can get you good seats. <laughs> so I thought, wow, that worked. That didn't go over well. Well, anyway, okay. my wife and kids come down for the Thanksgiving weekend, and it's a great time. And, of course, we're filming six days a week. We actually film Thanksgiving night. Uh, and Sunday, my wife goes home. I go back up to my room. My phone rings. It's Bert Lancaster. Ooh. And he says, Len? I'm sorry to call you so late. I, you know, because he met my wife and kids. I want you and your wife to come tonight to see Sinatra. I'm like, oh my God, Bert, my wife just left. With that, there's a knock on my door, and it's my father. Now, my father was a Teamster official. He was an elected trustee and business agent of Teamsters Local 560, who's a knock around guy, and he knew Sinatra early on in Hoboken. So I opened like, get in here. You want to go see Sinatra? So what are you talking about? Boom. So anyway, we go. We sit at the table with Bert Lancaster and his girlfriend at the time, who he later married, Barbara Sinatra, and a few people. It was about 10 of us at the table at resorts. Now, to be really honest with you, I, you know, I grew up with rock and roll, and I mean, I like Sinatra, but, you know, whatever. But I'm telling you, there was magic in that room. Uh, when Sinatra's ready to come out, I thought, you know, the lights would go down, a big drum roll, a spotlight, you know, the house lights are on, curtain opens, there's like maybe a 20-piece orchestra playing, everybody's just looking, there's a guy in the middle with his back to the audience, figured he's the conductor, well, the guy turns around, and it's Frank Sinatra, and the house goes wild. <laughs> he, he laughed. He was like, well, anyway, he put on a tremendous, tremendous show. And when he's done, he walks off the stage. No curtain calls, no bows, no nothing. Uh, just before he ended, they ring our table off with security. So now we're going to go into the Camelot restaurant that we saw. It's closed, and we're going to have dinner with Frank Sinatra. Now, before we go, you know, even Bert Lancaster at this point is waiting in the hallway till Frank is ready. <laughs> Frank is ready, the door opens, Barbara comes out, Frank comes out, every person that comes in, Barbara introduces to Frank by name. Now, it's my turn. I walk up, she says, Frank, this is Lenny Lutze. He's working on Bert's new film. And Sinatra was like really interested in that. I mean, that impressed him. And he's like, Oh, yeah? Okay. So he's got my hand, and she goes, oh, and, and Frank, Lenny's from Hoboken. He takes my hand, and he puts his two hands around mine. He looks me in the eyes. He was about my height, 5'7", yes. 5'8", five, five, but I'm telling you, mm. blue eyes mm. like you never saw before. Mm. Looks me straight in the eye, and he says, hey, kid, how's everything in Hoboken? Oh. 
So what I like to say, I don't remember what I said, but here's what I like to tell people. I looked in those steel cold blue eyes, yes. and as eloquently as I could, I said, Bahamana, bahamana, bahamana. <laughs> But anyway, at the table, of course, he remembered my dad and all. Uh, but Barbara made sure that Frank spoke to everybody at that table. And I'll tell you this, this was 1979, and I know the stories about the quarter Jack Daniels. A day may be true, maybe not, but at that particular dinner, he did not drink any Jack Daniels. Uh, maybe it was in his coffee cup, but we didn't see the bottle. But he was, they were both extremely gracious, marvelous people. It was, it was a thrill to this day. Sometimes I tell that story, I still get goosebumps. Oh, that's, that's so good. It's, 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 what's wonderful about Hoboken, it's got all of this rich history, and it's such a fascinating town, like you said. I don't know what it would be like to live in a boring town. I feel sorry for, you know, but other towns could maybe learn from, from Hoboken. But Hoboken's unique in its own way. It has a one square mile walkability, like you said. I, I ran into you about a week or so ago. You were sitting at a bakery, at, a, at the, I think it was a Dunkin' Donuts, sitting outside, bunch of guys. In fact, uh, Dominic the Barber, who I love, this Italian guy who sits out there and just waves to everybody. It's like you're in old Italy. Hey, how you doing? You know, ciao, ciao, you know. And there was Lenny and the guys, and they're hanging out. You could be in Europe. It could be like this piazza feeling, you know. It's, it's, it's the opposite of the alienation that you get in some towns where, nobody knows anybody there's like this sense of disconnection so Hoboken has that spirit of community Sinatra the music the lore the history it sort of hovers around things um, Claudia and I walked here from our apartment about three blocks away and we walked by Schnockenberg's the old cafe that has the old coca-cola sign and they restored that beautifully so it's just uh, it's just remarkable that we live here and it's such a joy to have you on Lenny and just to riff about Hoboken about anything that's special to you about uh, what's going on now how it's changing but I think we should really cover some of the key elements and one of them is on the waterfront this movie on the waterfront front, which uh, uh, whenever it comes on Turner Classics, I love to watch it. I have a real affection for it, especially because my dad was an actor when he was a young man, and he also worked in showbiz, my dad. He was working with backstage stuff at the IATSE uh, local in Bergen County. So my dad would do the uh, stage uh, back, you know, the, he would do the uh, lighting and stuff like that, the stage managing work and all that. At the Playhouse on the Mall in Bergen County, New Jersey, which, which was there. And, uh, but he was an actor when he was a young man. And to this day, he says, I could have been a contender. I could have been a contender. That famous scene, you know, from On the Waterfront. What is it about that movie? movie that you think is so relevant and so special and what connects it to Hoboken? You ask some great questions. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Bud Schulberg sat exactly in the chair where you're sitting now. Uh, do my honor waterfront tours and back in 2003 I had the great honor of doing it with Bud Schulberg. And incidentally, I've only done it twice since then, last year and this year. I felt that after you do it with Bud Schulberg, how do you top that? Uh, and, and I asked, you know, I mean, I worked on films and probably the only movie that they ever knew that was going to be a mega, mega hit was Gone with the Wind. You never know. Uh, you, you hope it's, everybody's shooting another Gone with the Wind. You hope it's going to be great, but you, you never know. And, and On the Waterfront uh, just struck a chord. Um, and what's amazing is that every major studio turned on the waterfront down. Every single major one. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, don't forget, it was the time of the House on american Activities Committee. Uh, they wanted to shoot, because they wanted to shoot the movie in black and white. He wanted to shoot it on location. Uh, the movie was actually shot in 53. Nobody was shooting in black and white in 53. Everything was technicolor. And so they had a lot of obstacles. And um, they wanted Marlon Brando. And Marlon Brando actually didn't want to do it. Uh, he actually turned it down. And uh, then along comes a gentleman by the name of Sam Spiegel, who was the producer. And without Spiegel, according to Bud Schulberg, the movie never would have gotten made. Now, Spiegel made uh, two other movies that were big after On the Waterfront you might have heard of. 
the bridge on the River Kwai, mm. and Lawrence of Arabia. But Spiegel said, uh, we have to get Brando. We need him. And if Kazan, who actually discovered Brando, couldn't get him, uh, they said, uh, well, take one more shot. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, they negotiate with Frank Sinatra. Oh. And I had asked Bud, I said, Bud, is it, the, you know, is it Hoboken myth? Is it lore? Is it true that Sinatra signed to do on the waterfront? He said, well, it's half true. He never signed, but yes, he wanted to do it, and we spoke to him. But Spiegel said, give me one more shot at Brando. Mm. Spiegel takes Brando to dinner and comes back with Brando. And Bud Schulberg said, from that day, I told Spiegel, you are not only a producer, you are a seducer. <laughs> so now when it's time to tell Frank, as Bud said, we have to tell Frank he's not getting the part. And Spiegel said, I'm not telling him. <laughs> And Kazan said, I'm not telling him alone, so you're coming with me, bud. So they had to tell Frank. And this is a quote from Bud Schulberg. Now, okay. was it true or not? I don't know. He said, when we told Frank he didn't have the part, you could hear him scream from Hollywood to Hoboken. <laughs> but you mentioned um, I could have been a contender. Yes. And I was, that scene was actually shot on the corner of First and River Streets in Hoboken. And while I'm standing there with Bud talking about it, uh, you know, I said, Bud, it's probably the second, no lower than the third most quoted movie line behind, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And, and that just the thought just popped into my head, and I said, Bud, what was your inspiration to write that? Yeah. And he said, well, I actually didn't write that, but I'll tell you how it came about. Mm -hmm. Uh, while Brando never boxes and on the waterfront, Kazan wanted him to get some boxing moves. Now, Bud Schulberg was a big uh, fight promoter. He owned fighters. He's actually in the Boxing Hall of Fame, okay. even though he never fought. So they go over to New York City to a gym on the west side, and they get a sparring partner by the name of Roger Donahue. And Schulberg knows a lot about fighters, and he's watching Donahue, and Donahue's teaching Brando, and Brando was a quick learner. Uh, in fact, Donahue said, give me a month with this guy, and I'll make him a, a middleweight. And they go, no, no, wait till the movie's over. So uh, when they're done, Schulberg says to Donahue, you know, you're really good. Why, why are you a sparring partner in the gym? Do you, you have a professional career? And Donahue says, well, I did, but you see, I have... Irish skin. So Bud Schulberg says, what's Irish skin? He said, if you hit me hard, I bleed. If not for that, I could have been a contender. Oh. Bud said the light went on in his head. Oh and he goodness. goes, oh, that's great. That's in our script. And he put it in there. And um, in my, my tour that I did that was filmed, uh, while I asked Bud that question, and Bud says what I just told you, they cut to Roger Donahue, and Roger Donahue tells the story. Uh, Roger Donahue passed away maybe about five years ago, uh, but, and Bud always gave him all the credit for that line. Oh well, now we finally heard, this is, this is breaking news, folks. You finally heard where that line uh, originated. I could have been a contender. Wow, wow. Well, my story in response to that is that I still want to be a contender, <laughs> okay? Uh, I, you see, I'm a host of a talk show, but my wife, Claudia, uh, without her love, without her support, this would not be happening. So I, I think it's important to have people who believe in your biggest dreams if you want to be a contender. And um, I was driven to my first acting audition in 1999 by a man named Tony Amato who was a Hoboken character like you would not believe. And I won't tell the whole story, just part of it. My friend Vito and I, we needed a ride to this acting audition in Jersey City, we, and his car wasn't working, so we needed a ride. So Tony was around. Tony, want to give us a ride? Get in the car. He's driving like a maniac. He's driving like voom, voom, and going around turns on two wheels. I found out later that Tony Amato was Burt Reynolds' private bodyguard, was a stuntman, did stunts in Hollywood for the French Connection and all these things, and also was a boxer. And that he told me that he taught Marlon a few moves on the, uh, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But Tony was, is, was really quite a character. We get to the audition, and I'm 
I didn't get the part, but I, the way he drove there, I was happy to be alive because he. Did you know Tony Amato? I knew Tony Amato very, very well. In fact, the last uh, Tony Amato has a very big part in a movie called Donnie Brasco, and I worked on Donnie Brasco, so that's the only time I ever actually met him on his set. But yes, ninety-nine uh, percent of what you said is absolutely true. Uh, Tony got his break from On the Waterfront. Another uh, character in Hoboken, guy by the name of Matty Russo, was in the film, and he's in the shape-up scene, and Matty has a line that says, what's the guy got to do to get a day's pay around here? <laughs> Matty went on to have a 40-year career. He was in the two Godfather movies, uh, the original Stepford Wives. Uh, but Matty, later on, there was a great movie filmed in New York called The Seven Ups with Roy Scheider, and the whole movie evolves around the kidnapping of Festa the Bales Bondsman. Mm -hmm. Matty Russo mm -hmm. is Festa the Bales Bondsman. Uh, Matty made a good living. There was Matty. Uh, it was f so many guys that uh, got their start on the waterfront. Another guy, Danny Rubino, who was also another fighter. Uh, I'm sorry, not Danny. His brother Mike. Danny was the fighter. In fact, the play, um, what was it? Um, Golden Gloves, a Golden Boy. Golden, that Boy. Golden Boy is based on really? Danny Rubino, because wow. he knew Louis LaRusso, who wrote it from Hoboken, but his brother Mikey Rubino was also a fighter. Mikey Rubino was the bridegroom and on the waterfront. He went on to work in movies. Uh, another guy you want to talk about, stunt driving, was him. Uh, Johnny Sanducci, uh, who lived on Garden Street. Uh, in fact, the jacket in On the Waterfront, the torch that's passed from Joey Doyle uh, to K.O. Dugan and then down to Terry Malloy, that was actually Johnny Sanducci's jacket. It was a brand new shiny jacket and the costume designer saw it and said, wow, we love that jacket. And kiddingly, he said, do you want to buy it? And he didn't know anything about film and I go, no, we don't want to buy it, but we'll rent it. Okay. And so they rented that jacket, and uh, I had asked Johnny many years later, I go, did you ever get that jacket back? And he said, no. It's probably at Columbia Studios in the box in the wardrobe department someplace with a tag on it, Terry Malloy on the waterfront. Uh, uh, wow. You know, we had on as one of our guests, Lenny, a man named Foster Hirsch, who is a film historian and a film critic. And we had him on the show, and he thinks that on the Waterfront is one of the greatest movies of the 20th century, absolutely. And uh, one of the things that Foster said is that he believes that that movie is about the birth of moral conscience. We see Marlon Brando in the beginning, and he knows that something wrong has happened, that this guy has been killed, and then Eva Marie Saint, who was his girlfriend, he finds out that's, that's actually her brother, and he was called up on the rooftop to be like a patsy here, and then there's this investigation going on, and there's going to be a hearing, and then should he speak, should he not speak out, and he's struggling, and he's wrestling with this decision, what should I do, what should I do? So this is about the birth of moral conscience, and yet, Hoboken also, they say, the original Johnny Friendly was a real character from Hoboken. Is that true? Or how much of the story of On the Waterfront is real and is based on, like, mafia activity that may have been in Hoboken or Brooklyn? Or Okay, well, there's been a lot of speculation about that. Uh, it actually wasn't. It's based on Father Corrigan uh, on the west side at, at Xavier. Uh, Malcolm Johnson, who wrote the stories for the old uh, New York uh, Sun. However, mm. it was very similar to what was going on in Hoboken. It was a gentleman by the name of Tony Mike DiVincenzo. Oh. Tony Mike had been a boxer. Tony Mike had been a longshoreman. Mm. He fought the corruption on the piers in Hoboken. After the movie came out, Tony Mike sued Columbia Pictures. Columbia Pictures settled out of court but we've always told, no one knows for sure, that Columbia Pictures gave Tony Mike $25,000. Now, on the tour, when we're sitting in Sinatra Park, on the waterfront, Bud and I, someone asks Bud that question. And Bud says, no, I never met Tony Mike until we came to Hoboken. Uh, well, the reason why Columbia settled out of court is because they wanted Bud Schulberg to go to testify to say, 
I never saw this guy before in my life. Mm-hmm. Bud Schulberg sat down with Tony Mike. Tony Mike told him his story. And Bud Schulberg said, yeah. Very, very similar to Terry Malloy, but not. So uh, Schulberg told Columbia Pictures and Spiegel, I'm not going to testify against this because although I never met him, uh, this is all from Malcolm Johnson and Father Corrigan, but he's got a claim. And so um, it happened. Uh, But if you, a little bit about On the Waterfront, uh, usually I start the tour by saying, you give a tour. Talk about your tour. Right. You give one. I just gave one last June. We're going to be giving another one uh, in October. Okay. Uh, just contact the Hoboken and Historical Museum. I uh, have nothing to do with the ticket sales, however they do it. Yeah. Uh, we do it by bus now, and the bus only holds 24 people, uh-huh. so you have to get mm. your seat. Uh, but what I usually start the tour with, why Hoboken? Yeah. Why did they shoot this movie in Hoboken? Well, there were many reasons. Number one, you are not going to shoot this movie on the west side of Manhattan because that's where the corruption was. It's what Father Corrigan and Malcolm Johnson are exposing. But why Hoboken? Well, a couple of factors. First factor, the mayor of Hoboken was a gentleman by the name of John Grogan. John Grogan was the national president of the Shipbuilders Union and a vice president of the AFL CIO. John Grogan wants to prove my waterfront is clean. Uh, the piers where the movie was shot with the old uh, Hamburg America North German Lloyd piers are vacant. The Port Authority is rebuilding those piers. So now you have the mayor willing to bring you. You have the Port Authority has the empty piers. And we had a gentleman, one of Grogan's right-hand men, John McAlevey, who was a Port Authority commissioner. Grogan got him that seat. So they put all this connection together, and when a production company came in, Grogan said one thing, hire Hoboken locals. Now, of course, Grogan was a union man, but Grogan didn't know anything about the Screen Actors Guild and how it worked. But they said, not a problem, because SAG will always let you have tons and tons of non-extra, non-union extras. Uh, and, and they did. And uh, so there's a story, in fact, Bud uh, mentions it uh, mentions it in the tour, that um, one day during the lunch break, a bunch of goons from New York City actually came over. They were shooting in what is now Sinatra Park, but the Ohio and America line, and they actually got to Kazan. They actually pushed them. They didn't punch them, they actually pushed them. Uh, but what happened is a gentleman by the name of Arthur Murata, who was the public safety director, he was a police captain. His brother Joe Murata was a police lieutenant. So they put Joe Murata, the lieutenant, in charge of the security detail. And, and that only lasted a couple of seconds. Hoboka police surrounded Kazan, drove those guys back. They never came back again, never bothered the film again. Wow, tremendous, tremendous stories here. Amazing. It's it's a film that really is embedded in the fabric of American culture. There's so much politics, there's so much history, and there's so many personal anecdotes that come out of it. And it's just pretty interesting to be living in a town in which it was filmed. And as you walk around, you know, there's Church Square Park. It was filmed there. There's the part that overlooks, it used to be uh, Maxwell Coffee. We used to have a, the, the biggest coffee factory in the world was right in Hoboken. Now it's, now it's uh, Maxwell Place Condos, but Elysian Park. And do you ever think of these things as you walk around Hoboken and you pass the alleyway and you say, well, there's the alleyway where the truck almost ran over Marlon and uh, Eva Marie Saint? And Actually, very, very often. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm from an old Hoboken family. If you talk to anybody, everybody has a relative who's in the wa- on the waterfront, and I'm no exception. That's right. I have a great uncle, George Lepre. Okay. His character even has a name, Hendrix, in the shape of scene. So next time you watch the movie and they call Hendrix, okay. you see my great uncle. Uh, but yes, uh, of course, now the piers are gone. There's Pier A Park, Pier C Park, as you alluded to, Maxwell Park. Place, Hoboken Beach, where the old Bethlehem Steel shipyard was. Uh, and I often wonder, I walk by there and I think, any of those old longshoremen or any of those people that worked at Bethlehem Steel, beyond their wildest dreams, yes. what's happened today? Uh, uh, years ago, we, we shot a movie in, in Hoboken called Voices. 
And uh, I was on the scout van, and uh, when they found out, oh, you're from Hoboken, uh, take us to where on the waterfront was filmed. Oh, so I said, okay. So we, we go to uh, First and Hudson, and I pull up. There's the parking garage and an office theater, and they go, what are you doing here? I go, you wanted to see where on the waterfront was filmed? Okay. Yeah, take us there. <laughs> no, you're there. <laughs> they go out there. You're kidding. <laughs> no. This is where the rooftop scenes were filmed. Uh, but at that point, so the piers were still there, so then we did get down, and we looked at the piers, and they're walking around awestruck, like, like, what are you looking at? You're looking at abandoned piers. You know? But you're right, it, it strikes a chord. Uh, just a, a quick story, too. Uh, 1994, in Ravina, Italy, I was sitting in an outdoor cafe, and we're on a tour. There's four American couples, my wife's sister and husband, and us and two other men, and all English. And there's an English couple sitting next to us. And how you doing? You're American? Or how'd you guess? Uh, oh, we love the Americans. Oh, we love the British. Uh, you know, he goes, I love American cinema. And my wife kicks me under the table. Don't say anything. Don't get into this. So I go, that's nice. He says... Do you know what my favorite American cinema is? Gone with the Wind? Yeah. Oh, no, no. He goes, On the Waterfront. Whoa. I'm like, God, I tried. I go, <laughs> just so happens that you see my wife here. Well, her kindergarten classroom is the lower church where the meetings were held at St. Peter and Paul. Oh. We became bosom buddies. <laughs> you know, so the movie has tremendous worldwide yes. appeal. Uh, no one can explain it. It wow. strikes a chord that, um, uh, you know, what is the, the best 100 films of the century, yes. I think the lowest ranking it ever had was number 10. It's been wow. as high as number 3. Wow. Uh, wow. It's just, I don't know why, but Schulberg didn't know why, but, oh my goodness. but it is. Oh, I want to say that, uh, you know, for Turner Classic Movies, this is the guy you got to have on, okay? Next time you screen on the waterfront, Lenny Lutzi, you should be giving commentary. Uh, you're just a genius on this. This is your, you knocked the ball out of the park. Unbelievable. Um, final question on the, on the waterfront. Uh, the, the courtroom scene at the end, was that filmed in the city hall? The entire movie, except for one scene, was filmed in Hoboken. Mm -hmm. Yes, the courtroom scene is the council chambers. Oh. The chair that sits next to the judge's bench is the chair that Marlon Brando sat in. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, okay. When I do the tour, we go there and I tell that to people, and then they get up and they sit in the chair and someone, take my picture in the chair. <laughs> yeah, but, but it has magic. Uh, wow. the, the entire movie, except for the one scene. Now, the one scene that wasn't filmed in Hoboken, no one will ever know it, okay. but it's the hole in the ship where K.O. Dugan gets killed with the whiskey. How do I know that for a fact? My great uncle was there. Uh, and the reason why was it filmed in Brooklyn? The Holland America Line was a very active steamship line in Hoboken at the time. Yeah. And they couldn't get the longshoremen to work because there were no containers then. The cargo was all handled by hand. Mm -hmm. So would you rather unload cargo or stand on line with a movie camera looking at you for the same money? Mm -hmm. You'll go in a movie. Mm -hmm. So the Holland American Line had a very hard time getting the longshoremen. So when the production company went to them and said, we like to film this scene in the hold of your ship, they said, no way find another ship. So they went to Red Hook, Brooklyn. The interesting thing about that scene, uh, there's one big interesting thing and small interesting thing to me. Uh, when Carl Malden is making his speech and they're throwing an orange and an egg and a beer can at him, yes. the beer can hits him on the left side of his forehead and it actually hit him and it actually cut him. And he was a method actor out of the actor's studio, and Kazan yelled cut, and Walden goes, no, no, keep this going. Uh, and it's real blood. Uh, that I heard from my uncle. And then many years later, I worked on the Amityville Horror with Rod Steiger, and I spent a lot of time with Rod. I told Rod, you know, when I was a kid, I watched on the waterfront, yes. and he said, well, I hope you weren't too young of a kid. I go, well, I, I was. But, <laughs> and uh, we talked about that and different things. Uh, but the other, get back to the hole in the ship for a second. Yes. 
The guy who drops the whiskey on K.O. Duke, and his character's name is Specs. His real name is Michael Dowd. He was a real longshoreman from the west side of Manhattan. He did have his Screen Actors Guild card. Uh, I worked with his son-in-law and his grandson in the film business. But the thing about him, you'll remember, uh, there's a Honeymooners episode. I call it, Go and Get Your Friend Harvey. <laughs> Where Jackie Gleason is, so they're shooting Paul, they walk away, Jackie Gleason or Connie come in, they come back, this little guy goes, me and my friend Harvey, we're shooting that, Harvey's a big guy and he's going to fight Jackie Gleason, and Art Connie comes up with this scheme, I got a guy from the sewer, going to come in, you're going to make believe you hit him and scare Harvey, well how I know it's him, oh well, he'll say, hey, get a load of fatso, okay. so guy walks in, and he says, hey, get a load of fatso. That's Michael Dowd. Oh. Specs him on. Oh. Jackie Gleason hits him. And then the fake guy comes in. So Jackie Gleason really hit him. Okay. Uh, but uh, one of the things, though, that Steiger told me, yes. uh, the famous I could have been a contender scene. Yes. Now, when you look at the scene, there were Venetian blinds on the back of the window in the car. Right. What happened was uh, they didn't do a lot of films in New York back then. There was a lot of live television. And they had what we call an insert car. When you see a car, a guy's driving a car in the film and he's always talking to the person next to him because he's not driving the car. The car's being towed by an insert car. It was supposed to come, but the people on the west side put the kibosh to it. They didn't get it. So the prop guy runs to the Myers Hotel, takes the Venetian blind with a bathroom window and puts it there. Now they shoot the scene. You shoot the master. Then you shoot the close-ups. They shoot Brando's close-ups. Steiger feeds the lines off camera. Now it's time for Steiger's close-ups. Marlon Brando left. Uh. Rod Steiger told me it was the most unprofessional thing he has ever seen in his life. And I told this in front of Bud. And Bud's, I caught Bud off guard for a minute. And Bud said... He was still mad about that? <laughs> uh, yes, he was. He was very mad about it. Of course, to cover that up, production company said that Brando had to go see his therapist. Oh, oh. Brando was not a friendly guy. Uh, Brando had no close friends in the business. Uh, he was very aloof. He was a loner. There was no great camaraderie on a set. Uh, it's just the way he was. Yes, wow. I want to say something also now about uh, this wonderful Hoboken Elks Club that you and I both belong to, and they have these great Monday night football dinners in the fall, and we get to hang around and talk and kibitz and tell these stories. Usually we talk more than, than watch the game, you know? Um, and I had gotten involved with the Elks as well for several years and uh, was going to meetings, became an officer and got active there, and I got to know people who were actually working on the docks in Hoboken, some of these men. And they're the greatest guys in the world. I love these guys. One of them, his name is Richie Hansen. He actually worked uh, in the coffee factory, Maxwell House. And these guys are just fabulous men. And, the, you know, so I feel like a sense of connection between myself and the movie through these people who work there, who are part of the dock. And that brings us to social change as well because a lot of these factories were outsourced and you had real jobs in town at one time and now you know a lot of that has been uh, shipped to Mexico and China and here and there but you said that people said that when Maxwell House factory was in business you could actually smell the coffee when you walk down the street yeah, it's funny you talk about Richie Hansen. Yeah. Richie and I were inducted into the Elks together oh. back in 1973. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, you could actually, you always knew when it was going to rain yes. because of the humidity, you would smell that rich roast aroma air. Oh. So we always knew it. Oh. And especially here uptown more than downtown. But yes, uh, there was a tremendous amount. I mean, we could be here, uh, just some of the things that were in Hoboken. Tootsie Roll was in Hoboken. Mighty Fine was in Hoboken. Royal Pudding was in Hoboken. Lipton Tea was in Hoboken. Chasing Sanborn Coffee was in Hoboken, besides Maxwell House. Uh, years ago, I'm doing a, a Jello. Jello was in Hoboken. Doing a Jello commercial out at the Nassau Coliseum. And I'm talking to the agency people, and I'm like, 
why is Jello even wasting money doing commercials? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're the king of the heap. I mean, what what competition do you have? Royal pudding and mighty fine pudding? The girl looks at me and she goes, why do you know so much about pudding? <laughs> I don't know anything about pudding. She said, well, you know our, our main competitors. Right. Well, the only reason why I know them is because all three of those products were made in Hoboken, and I'm from Hoboken. And she says, did you go to high school in Hoboken? I said, yes, I did. She goes, my husband's aunt was a teacher in the high school. What was her name? Miss Ware. I go, you're kidding me. I had Miss Ware as my English teacher. <laughs> so there again, okay. that Hoboken connection pops up in the most unexpected places, and, and you never know where. Fantastic. Lenny, let's take a little uh, jaunt around the home now, and we're going to take a look at some of the things on your wall, because there's just so much here. You know, you have so much to say, we're going to definitely have to come back, because this is like a long playing, you know, you're a one-man show, Lenny. You've got to take the show on the road, but uh, let's take the show on the road in the, in the home right now. Okay. Let me just say this. You don't know how many times I've been offered to take it on the road and get out of town. Okay. We're not going to talk about that, though, okay? <laughs> we're here in Lenny's study now, and we're looking at a photograph of John Grogan, who was a very famous mayor of Hoboken, who also ran for U.S. Senate, and he actually came pretty close to become a United States senator. Yes, what happened was he ran, and a professor at St. Peter's College in Jersey City also ran, and the professor got... 17,000 votes statewide, and Grogan lost to Harrison Williams statewide by 11,000 votes. So had that professor not ran, uh, those votes probably would have gone to Grogan. Definitely the votes in Hudson County would have gone to Grogan, but yes, he would have been a United States Senator. And Harrison Williams actually wound up leaving office in a scandal, is that correct? Ab scam. What are we looking at here, Lenny? Well, we're looking at my collection of old bottles, mm -hmm. uh, all from Hoboken. My collection of mugs, all from Hoboken. The tin cans are stuff that was manufactured in Hoboken, but are long gone. Just a little bit of my Hoboken collection. People say there's a lot of mugs in Hoboken. Is that true? A lot of old mugs. Well, absolutely. They're not as many as there used to be, but yeah, not when we had the Barbary Coast, there were a lot of mugs is correct. <laughs> Wow. So these were all factories that made these products that were in town, that hired workers that were working in town. And then after work, everybody would go to the bar. Is that right? Well, one would assume that. Uh, <laughs> we had more bars in a square mile than any other place on earth. So uh, Nothing like a drink before going home after work. Exactly. <laughs> and what is this, Lenny? Le the Leonard Lutze Democratic Club. My, my, my uncle uh, came back from World War II and uh, my family had been close with McFeely. In fact, my grandfather was a barber, he used to cut McFeely's hair, but my uncle split with him and started the Leonard Lutze Independent Democratic Club and backed the ticket in 1947 that ended McFeely's rule. McFeely was mayor of Hoboken for 17 years, from 1930 to 1947, but he was first elected a commissioner in 1916. So McFeely's the longest serving wow. elected official in the history of Hoboken. You know, you're a very charismatic guy, you're a very articulate man, and I would think that the, the powers that be or whatever would be courting you for politics or over the years. Have you had any political runs? Well, you know, I, I'm not a politician, and I have two elections that I lost to prove it. <laughs> okay, so we won't talk about politics then. Let's stick to culture, let's stick to culture. Let's go... What's this? Oh, now, okay, this is, all right, a very important thing now. This is the proclamation from the mayor. Talk a little bit about when you were officially given this uh, position as the Hoboken historian. I'm actually the fourth person to hold the title of official Hoboken city historian. And I knew all three of my predecessors, and I had been to all three of their homes, mm -hmm. but they didn't all know each other. The first one was a gentleman by the name of George Muller, who was in a wheelchair, who had polio when he was a kid. The second one was John Heaney, who lived on 11th and uh, Garden Street, that house on the corner. Mm -hmm. And the third one was George Kirschgesner, whose family owned United Decorating, which was in business from 
1899 until March the 17th, 2016. They had a 117 year run. And when George passed away, uh, the deputy city clerk, John De Palma, who was a dear friend of mine, uh, proposed me to Mayor Russo to be city historian. And uh, I got it. Fabulous. You're doing a good job, my friend. You're doing a good job. Let's uh, walk into this yeah, room. Lenny, oh, let's that. take a look at that. Letter. Go ahead, Lenny. Go ahead. The, the blue letter up there okay. is a handwritten letter from the first mayor of Hoboken, Cornelius Klickner, that was given to me as a birthday present by John De Palma. Ah, oh my goodness gracious. Now look, there's Ronald Reagan over there. Get Reagan and Bush. And the reason I want to bring Reagan into this in particular is because Reagan came to Hoboken in 1985, 84, I'm sorry, uh, with Frank Sinatra. That was one of like the most famous days of Hoboken. Talk about that. That was, I think, Sinatra's homecoming in Hoboken, sort of, yeah. Well, very good. Uh, yeah. We just, uh, I mentioned I do a... Uh, internet radio show, show called Hoboken's Talking with Jay Trelease. Mm -hmm. And last year in November, we inter interviewed Frank Garrett Jr., who was the son of Frank Garrett Sr., who was Sinatra's godfather. And Frank Garrett passed away uh, two months ago. Yeah. So we were very lucky to get oh. that interview. And we also interviewed Santo Malisi, mm -hmm. who wrote the letter to Sinatra inviting him to Hoboken. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, Santos said, why don't we invite the, the president? And everybody said... As an you, afterthought, as an afterthought. Uh, yeah. No, are you crazy? Uh, you want to write a letter, write a letter. Right. So Santo wrote the letter and he said, look, here's what will probably happen. Right. We'll get a letter, White House stationery saying, the president would love to come, but scheduling conflicts, blah, 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 blah. Well, anyway, they get a letter and they say, He's coming. Oof. Now, they know this two months in advance. They only know two weeks in advance. Uh. When I say they, not, not St. Anne's Committee, but the city of Hoboken. Jim Giordano was the public safety director who passed away a few months ago, was my step-uncle. Uh. They know two weeks in advance that Sinatra is coming. Mm. So he tried to totally keep that under wraps. Uh, it was a, a day in Hoboken. You're like, you know, you, you know where you were when Kennedy got shot. You know where you were 9/11. Well, everybody knows where they were. July the 26th, 1984, in Hoboken, and uh, of course he landed at Stevens. And the limousine pulls up in front of St. Anne's Church. The door opens, and who gets out? But Frank Sinatra, no, who, I'm sorry, okay. who got out first yes. was um, Governor Kane. Okay. And people clapped. Eh, yeah. They weren't crazy. <laughs> okay. Who gets out next? President Reagan. And a uh, crowd, uh, tremendous. Yes. Who gets out third? Sinatra. Now they really go yeah. crazy. Oh, and that's God. it. Uh, they, they, they were so enthused with yes. Sinatra, they were supposed to, they did have the dinner in the old St. Anne's School, which is now Hoboken Catholic Academy, but Sinatra left. And he had his car parked yeah. on 6th and Madison. The school is on 7th and Madison. And Sinatra, and, and basically one bodyguard, is walking down, yes. Mad actually walking up Madison Street. And Sal Cimelli, who was a third ward councilman, and lived there and happens to come out his door. Yeah. And who's 20 feet from his house? Frank Sinatra. Oh, and Sal goes, <laughs> Frank, where are you going? Aren't you going into school? And Frank stops and he says, it isn't my day. Very much like Terry Malloy wasn't his day in the garden when he had to lose to Wilson. So oh, Sinatra oh, not could have been a contender. Nice. Sinatra was. Imagine how big do you have to be yes. to overshadow the President of the United States. Right. A man who wins 49 out of 50 states right. in re-election. Right. Sinatra overshadowed him. But yes, Reagan, Sinatra, kind of heroes of mine. Oh my goodness. And I'm a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a little nonpartisanship for a change, for a change. You want to get the Sinatra letter? Oh, yes. Let's get the... Here is a letter from Frank Sinatra. You wrote to Frank and you got a letter back. Yes. What happened was, uh, when I was president of the museum and before that, we did a publication called Hoboken History Take Magazine. And for Sinatra's 80th birthday, I uh, got his address from, from SAG. 
and uh, we sent Sinatra all the copies of Hoboken History Magazine, and we said, you know, we're not looking for any money, we're not looking for anything. All we would like is a reply like Santo Melisi thought he'd get from the White House. Mm. Well, lo and behold, a letter comes to my house with the return address, Sinatra Enterprises, Malibu, California, and the letter addressed to me. And that's the original letter, and uh, the museum wow. got a copy of it, but didn't get the letter. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's go in the hallway here. Let's just go in here. What room are we in now? What would you call the room? This is like the ante room here. Okay. The hallway. Okay, the hallway. Uh, again, everything is Hoboken related. You see a picture of the battleship New Jersey, and you go, what is that doing here? Well, way back in 1978, we formed the committee, the Hoboken New Jersey Battleship Committee. The first meeting was held downstairs at my dining room table, and we went on, we became, they narrowed it down to three towns in New Jersey, and Hoboken was in the final three, but the ship was actually awarded to Jersey City, uh, and it ended up in Camden due to politics, because the man who chaired the committee for the state was an assemblyman from Camden, and, you know, it's gone bankrupt twice in Camden, and I've gone there with the Boy Scouts, and it's behind a fence, and they lock your car in a garage. Mm -hmm. uh, if not Hoboken, I think it should have been Liberty State Park, but that's why that's here. Oh, wow. Let's just take a pan around, baby. Look up here. Uh, on the waterfront bus tour, that pink flyer that's very colorful, it says Saturday, May 10th, 2003, reservations are required. A tour of locations used in the Oscar-winning film will be conducted by Leonard Lutze, city historian, accompanied by Bud Schulberg, screenwriter for the film. Uh, let's see what else we have around here. Oh, what is the, oh, this is a very interesting thing now. What is this artifact? This is actually something from the movie itself, right? Lenny, tell, tell what that is. That's the call sheet. Every night and before the film wraps on a set, all the crew, all the actors get a call sheet, which explains where we're going tomorrow, what we're shooting tomorrow, what actors work tomorrow, what props. Of course, the call sheets have expanded. They don't look like that anymore. Uh, but that was my dad's. They brought my dad down to meet Marlon Brando. Mm. And I don't know how it came about, but Marlon Brando signed it. Eva Marie Saint signed it. Carl Malden worked that day and wanted to sign it, but my dad didn't know who he was. He literally chased him. <laughs> Your dad was a tough uh, guy. You had to know my dad. Oh. And uh, when Bud Schulberg came to my house, I had Bud sign it. So that's signed by three Academy Award winners, and it's a piece of movie history. Not just Hoboken history, oh, yes. but movie history. And that date is Wednesday, December the 2nd, 1953. Wow. You know, we got to bring uh, uh, Robert Osborne from Turner Clare. He would love it here. He would absolutely go crazy. Um, look at this we here, baby. This is the famous scene in the alleyway with uh, Marlon Brando and Ava Marie Saint. That was a, and of course, this is Court Street. So Hoboken, you can walk through these areas and it's like almost like you're 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 part of cinema history when you're in Hoboken especially with on the waterfront you know uh, now if we go higher up baby look at that is that you and Bud Schoberg yes at a restaurant where was the restaurant that's uh, Dino and Harry's 14th and Garden that's the oh. restaurant where Marlon Brando takes Eva Marie Saint for her first drink oh. and while they're sitting at a table the wedding party comes in and they come through as I said, Mikey Rabino's the groom, yes. and they walk through a doorway, yes. and when the camera sees them on the other side of the doorway, they're on 3rd and Hudson at the Myers Hotel. Right. <laughs> a little surrealism there. Um, we're down to about three minutes left. Let's wrap it up. Let's go sit back down. So we're going to wrap up our dialogue with uh, Lenny Lutze, the Hoboken historian here in the upstairs parlor of his lovely Hoboken home. And Claudia is just taking some a pan around just to see what a gorgeous room this is and how beautiful it looks aesthetically. It's a work of art itself, Lenny, this room. And this is a room where Bud Schulberg actually was sitting in the chair that I'm in now. I feel like I'm Unbelievable. This is like channeling greatness here, you know. Um, and uh, 
you know, we only have a few minutes left. We hope you'll come back again. I know uh, Dorothea Lang was a famous photographer from Hoboken, wasn't far from here. Her photographs actually captured the Great Depression at its time, so there's a social aspect of that. I'm trying to think. Oh, I, the guy that, uh, Stephen Foster, I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. There's a piece in the Hoboken Reporter today about that. What do you think about Stephen Foster? Yes, the, in fact, the building at 601 Bloomfield Street is the only building standing that we know that Stephen Foster actually lived in. And there is a plaque on it, and in 1953, I believe it was the 100th anniversary of I Dream of Jeannie being published, uh, Stephen Foster's granddaughter and great-granddaughter came to Hoboken. They had a big reception. Uh, Mayor Grogan, they dedicated that plaque. They had a party up at Stephen's at the Old Castle where the student center is now. Uh, yeah, we've had um, a few um, famous people uh, lived in Hoboken over the years. Uh, Mrs. Edelman, her real name was Schneider. She came from Hoboken. She married into the Edelman family. They had a little bakery. She built the Edelman's empire. Oh. Hazel Bishop, uh, young people don't remember Hazel Bishop. It used to be Hazel Bishop Cosmetics. Her father owned the theater on First Street across from City Hall, which is now the Shannon Hall. That was the Bishop Theater. And one thing that I found very interesting, you know, people, um, because of Hoboken History Magazine, uh, my address was in it, and when John De Palma was the city clerk, people called and he gave out my number all over the world. But people send me different things, really, um, from, from you know, all about Hoboken. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Malcolm McLean died, I don't know, about 10 years ago. Somebody sent me his obituary from the New York Times. And I thought, why would someone send me, you know, he owned McLean Trucking, uh, he owned Sealand. And the reason why it was sent to me was because they had interviewed McLean years ago. Now, he's the man who invented the containerization of ships. And the interview was said to Malcolm McLean, how did you ever get that idea for containerization? And Malcolm McLean said, well... Well, waiting online, it appeared in Hoboken, New Jersey. I thought to me, there's got to be a better way to do this. So Hoboken is really the birthplace of containerization. And if you look at containerization, that's what actually changed the whole Hoboken waterfront. Took it from an industrial pier, freight piers, to what's now a lawn. Uh, all we need is sheep in the meadow. And of course, all the bars across the street are gone. You know, the American Hotel, which is now, I think, Texas, Arizona? Yes. Well, there was a saying that if you had one beer, you start at Texas, Arizona, yes. and you had one beer in every bar, yes. you'd never get to Fort Street. <laughs> and I happen to know that that's true. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, uh, Lenny Lutze, you should be a demand in every, every dinner party in this town. Anybody who wants someone interesting to tell great anecdotes about Hoboken and learn something about the history of this, this great city, Lenny Lutze is the man. It is a pleasure to know you, sir. It's a great honor to have you on our show, and I hope you'll come back and join us again sometime. Thank you very much.